Welcome to College Algebra. <laughs> We're back from the break. <laughs> How is everyone? <laughs> the last class was not emotionally engaged in the topic <laughs> at hand. <clears throat> so, here's hoping that we can... <laughs> I don't know, do better, I'm, I'm not sure. So I hope everyone had a, had a, great, had a great break. So last time, before we left, uh, we had just started talking about inverse functions. So let's continue that uh, briefly. So for example, suppose we have this function. f of x is, um, say, 4x uh, minus 3 in the numerator <coughs> and then divided by say 2x plus 5 in the denominator <coughs> okay so my first question of you does this function have any horizontal asymptotes doesn't have any horizontal asymptotes. No. Okay. So it's degree one. So in the first place, it's a rational function because it's polynomial divided by polynomial. And it is degree one divided by degree one. And if you like memorizing, the, memorizing that catchphrase, the Bobo Botten thingy, this is, wh this is where the numerator and denominator have the same degree. Mm -hmm. So um, that means that the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficients. Therefore, the horizontal asymptote <coughs> is the ratio of the leading coefficients, which is 4 over 2, which is 2. So yes, it has a horizontal asymptote. And that horizontal asymptote is 2. Okay. Uh, 2. Does it have a vertical asymptote? Yes. It does. Okay. So where and, and why? Is it negative 5 over 2? At negative 5 over 2. I agree. So, so... How do you check? What are the places you should look for a vertical asymptote? Where the denominator is what? Zero. Zero. So look for zeros in the denominator. OK, so we want to solve. 2x plus 5 is 0. Well, 2x is negative 5, so x is negative 2.5. Okay, now, it is not true that every 0 in a, denom in a denominator is a vertical asymptote. That's not true. Remember, we had to go through a, we had to go through a classification process to determine the category of points for rational functions. If you remember, we went through a, a categorization saying that this point is regular, this point is a vertical asymptote, or this point is a whole. So we have found a zero in the denominator, which means this point is not regular, which means that it, it, that it is either a vertical asymptote or a whole. Now my question to you is, is how do you determine that, okay, yes, in fact, this is a vertical asymptote and it is not a whole? Plug it into what? Into the numerator, right? So what do you get if you plug, so do, do you get zero if you plug negative two and a half into the numerator? No, you do not, right? So if you plug in negative two and a half, you get uh, negative 10 minus three is negative 13, which isn't zero. So, <coughs> so yes, 
this is a uh, vertical asymptote. And to be and to be precise, cons concerning x is equal to negative 2.5, the multiplicity in the denominator, what is the multiplicity of negative 2.5 in the denominator? 1. It appears one time. And what is the multiplicity in the numerator? No. Zero times, right? How many times does it, how many times does it appear in the numerator? Zero times. Okay. So the fact that the fact that the multiplicity of negative 2.5 is not in the denominator is not zero means it is a it is a whole or a vertical asymptote, and the fact that the multiplicity in the denominator is greater than the multiplicity in the numerator means that it is in fact a vertical asymptote. If this had turned out to be also a 1, if it was 1 and 1, then it would be a whole. If it was 10 and 10, it would be a whole. Okay. So now, that being the case, we can make a sketch. Uh, so let's sketch y is f of x. Now there's two very useful things that we can sketch. So what what very useful things can we sketch in order to understand in order to understand the, the asymptote totes? So specifically, we have a horizontal asymptote of y is two. So let's plot that. We also have a vertical asymptote of x is negative 2 and a half. Now these, these lines are not part of the function. They're only there to help us understand what the function is uh, and what it's doing. So let's consider, uh, we need to know for each for each part of the plot is it going to be in the top left or the bottom left and is it going to be in the top right or the bottom right so the way you can make that determination is let's plot a point so for example if we were to plug in 0 if we plug in x is 0 then what do we get -3 we get -3 over 5 which in particular is negative so at zero, <coughs> at zero, we get uh, negative three over five, so that's about right here. So there's a point right there. So there's gotta be a point there. <coughs> okay, and uh, how about a point on the left side? So what's something that's, that's over here, an x value that's over here? Negative Okay, so four. So if we plug in negative four, if we plug in negative four, then what do we get in the numerator? The negative 19, and what do we get in the denominator? Negative three. So negative 19 divided by negative three is in the first place positive. It's about six and a third. Okay, so that point is going to be like up here. So, can you tell what the function is going to look like then from, from this? Yeah, it's going to have to look like... So that's going up towards the vertical asymptote. And then this one... Like
think so. Okay. This I plugged in. I plugged in the value x is four. Okay. So this is the point four and nineteen over three. Uh, sorry, negative four and nineteen over three. And this is the point zero and uh, th negative three fifths. Okay, so now we're going to reach way back and I'm going to ask, okay, how about this function that we've drawn here? Is this function invertible? Opposite of no? <laughs> like, yeah. so, so remember that, I mean invertible with respect to functions. So we have invertib invertibility with respect to something. So. I could ask, given a number like 8, does 8 have an additive inverse? Yes, it does. It's negative 8. Because when you, when you add 8 and negative 8, you get 0, which is the additive identity. Does 8 have a multiplicative inverse? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? 1 eighth. Because the product of 8 and 1 eighth is 1, which is the multiplicative identity. So, now, does every number have an additive inverse? Yes. They all do. Every number has an additive inverse. Does every number have a multiplicative inverse? No. What number does not have a multiplicative inverse? Zero. Because there's no number x such that zero times x is one. There's no, there's no in inverse of x, multiplicative inverse of x. There is an uh, uh, mul mul multiplicative inverse of zero. There, there is an additive inverse of zero. What's the additive inverse of zero? Zero. zero. So the test for whether or not a function has a multiplicative inverse is, well, is this number zero? OK. What is the test to determine whether or not a function has a compositional inverse? That's the name, that's one to one is the name, is the name of the class of functions that are invertible. But what is the visual test is what I'm, the horizontal line test, right? So consider this thing that we've plotted. Does every horizontal line cross zero or one times? Yes. So this function is one to one. And therefore, it is invertible. So the question was, does the inverse function exist? Which is equivalent to me asking, does it pass the horizontal line test? And the answer is yes. Well, if that's the case, then I want you to compute the inverse. Okay, so this process <coughs> starts out, you write, okay, y is f of x. Then you play, replace f of x with its formula. y is 4x minus 3 divided by 2x plus 5. And now you have to do something critical here. What is the thing you must do? Yes, you swap x's and y's. You say, okay, that y is going to become an x, and these x's will become y's. So 4y minus 3 divided by 2y plus 5. Now, I definitely want you and need you to remember that, that at this step, what you're doing is you're performing the swap of x with y. But I'd be really happy if you could tell me what this means geometrically. What does it mean? So we did something here. We, we sw swapped all the x's with y's and y's with x's. But, but geometrically, what did this do? OK, I, I do agree that, for example, if the point 
uh, say 510 was, a, was one of the points, then the swapped point would be 10, 5. So the coordinates have been transposed. But if you were to look at a plot, if you were to look at a plot and, and do this, perform this swapping procedure, what would happen to the plot? Reflect how? Yes, it would, it would reflect across y is x. Remember how we would do that? We would draw the line y is x and then, and then reflect it. That's what's happening here. So this is reflection. Across y is x, which is to say y's become x's and x's become y's. 10, 5 becomes 5, 10. 4, 4 becomes 4, 4. <laughs> That's like if you put your hand on the mirror, right? Where does it reflect to? Itself, right? It doesn't move. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we've done this, let's solve for y. So I'll multiply both sides by the denominator of the right-hand side. 2y plus 5x is 4y minus 3. I'll multiply out the left-hand side. 2xy plus 5x is 4y minus 3. And so now that we've multiplied, you can see, ah, well, there's four terms, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Some of them have y's, some of them do not. Let's move all the terms with y to the left, all those without y to the right. So 2xy minus 4y is negative 5x minus 3. OK, now what? Yeah, let's take out the y on the left-hand side so that we would have 2x <coughs> minus 4 and then multiplied by y is negative 5x minus 3. And now what? Right, we can solve for y by saying that y is negative 5x minus 3 divided by 2x minus 4. And that's the inverse function. OK, now, here's a new function. Does this function, does this function have a horizontal asymptote? What's its horizontal asymptote? Right. And I'm going to write that as negative 2.5. Does it have a vertical asymptote? Yes. What's its vertical asymptote? 2. Now I claim that Okay, so in the first place, you can, uh, you can get that from the formula for the inverse function, right? It has a horizontal asymptote because it's degree 1 over degree 1, so that the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficients. Also, it has a vertical asymptote because observe that when you plug in 2, the denominator is 0, and the numerator is not. So it has a vertical asymptote. But I claim that you knew that even before we did this computation at all. It's not the same, right? So notice, it's yeah, it's reversed, right? So look, the original function has a horizontal asymptote of y is 2. So the inverse function must have a vertical asymptote of x is 2. Because when you reflect, when you reflect across y is x, a horizontal line becomes 
a vertical line, and a vertical line, a horizontal line. Okay, so, so notice, horizontal asymptote of y is 2, vertical asymptote of x is 2. Uh, look at that, I wrote that wrong, look. Let's fix that. So this red X that I'm writing was formerly a Y. So it has a, it has a vertical asymptote. The original function has a vertical asymptote of X is negative 2.5. So the inverse function has a horizontal asymptote of y is negative 2.5. Okay, good. Any questions about this? These functions, these kind of functions that look like this, that look like ax plus b over cx plus d, are so important that they have their own, they have their own name among mathematicians. It's not necessary for you to know it. But just for those of you who like to know that kind of thing, such functions that look like ax plus b over cx plus d are called Mobius functions. And it's interesting Interesting that the <coughs> inverse of a Mobius function is itself a Mobius function. Interesting. Okay, so another example. So let's consider the function f of x is square root um, <coughs> x minus 3. So my first question for you is, is, what is the domain of this function? Okay, Al almost right, right, or equal, or equal right? So in a math class, we always split that hair, right? So we need the argument, the thing being put in to the radical, to be non-negative, which is to say x is greater or equal to 3. And then written in interval notation, how do you write this in interval notation? Right. Square parentheses, also known as bracket. OK. So, 2, I want you to sketch three things. I want you to sketch y is the square root of x. I want you to sketch y is f of x. And I want you to sketch y is f inverse of x. OK, so the first one, is a function that is among those that we memorized. So y is square root of x. How does it look? Other way, right? Like this, right? OK, so that's good information for us, because that helps us understand what the plot of f is. So now what I'm asking is, uh, I'm saying, OK, well, if that's y is the square root of x, then, then what, what f is, this is what you do when you replace the x with x minus 3.
So we're replacing that x with x minus 3. What does the action of replacing x with x minus 3 do? It shifts it right. It shifts it right. Okay. You can think of it like this. You can say, okay, I'm going to take this red and I'm going to pin it down. I'm going to hold it still. And then because x is being replaced with x minus 3, that means I'm going to grab the axis and I'm going to pull it left 3. So the axis is moving left 3. Well, if you closed your eyes and I did that and there was nothing else for you to see, what, would, what you would see is you'd see the red move to the right because, because the axis is moving left. Alternatively, you can just think of it that the, axis, that the plot is moving right. Whatever is best for your brain there. Okay, so this looks like this. So this is y is f of x. Okay, so now, I asked you to compute, I asked you to sketch the inverse function. Well, in the first place, we should ask ourselves, selves, is there an inverse in the first place? Can not everything have an inverse? Uh, not everything has an inverse. Just like 7 is multiplicatively invertible, but 0 is not. So some functions are, are compositionally invertible, but some functions are not. So is this function compositionally invertible? Mm -hmm. Yes. What is the, what, how do you tell? The horizontal line test, right? So notice that horizontal lines down here have zero intersections. That's fine. And then horizontal lines up here have one intersection. That's fine, right? All horizontal lines need zero or one intersections. Okay, so yes, the inverse function does in fact exist. So it makes sense for me to ask for you to sketch it. So that being the case, This is y is f of x. Then given an invertible function, how do you plot its inverse? Okay. So there's, there's infinitely many coordinates. <laughs> right. So how about what's this point right here? Zero, uh, 3, 0. Maybe, maybe you meant what, which one does it reflect to? So this is 3, 0, so what does it reflect to? 0, 3. Zero, three. So it's right here. And then we could, I could ask about a multitude of such points, and then we could do that. But there's a, there's a more expedient way to do it. What is the geometric interpretation of function inversion. We talked about it on the last page. That's the, that's the analytic one, swapping coordinates. Right, exactly. So let's, let's draw y is f of x, or sorry, y is x, I mean to say. And the function inverse, well, it's what you get when you, when you reflect the red across the dashed line, across y is x. Okay, so then I, when I'm doing it, sometimes I like to do it like this so I can have a mirror symmetry. Now this is not an art class. Okay, you're not being graded on your artistic ability, but it should look more or less like this, right? I didn't do it perfect, it's not perfect. But, you know, I didn't do it like this, right? <laughs> it's bowing the correct direction. Okay, so this is the inverse function. How did you like to uh, push the coordinates in that point and not like make them and make it negative? Because the, the analytic interpretation of, of um, inverting a function is swapping the coordinates. So, 
like the point, if the point 0.35 was on the plot, mm -hmm. then the point 0.53 would be on the inverse plot. Mm -hmm. So 10.12 would become 12.10. 3.0 becomes 0.3. Other questions? <coughs> okay. So now, I asked you about the domain of F. How about the range of F? So back to this function here. Zero to infinity. Zero to infinity. So to put it into sort of a common language, the, the domain is a set of all inputs, the set of all x values that can be input. Whereas the range is a set of all outputs that are achievable. Okay, the set of all y values. So we can't get y values down here. There's no intersection for this, for this function. But here we can get y is 0, and we can get y is anything greater than 0, because this keeps going up. So the range <coughs> is the set, set of all outputs, which is to say y values. And that set is 0 to infinity. So now I'd like for you to observe something that we talked about when we talked about inverse functions the first time. But I'd like to make the point clear again, if I can. So the domain of f we already did it in the very first place. We said it was 3 to infinity. And we just said the range of f is 0 to infinity. So that's the domain and range of f. Now how about the inverse function? What are its domain and range? Right. So, so let's have a look. Even if you were to look here, say, <coughs> just at the blue function, ignore how we got it, and just observe that we have it. So the domain is the set of all x values. So are these x values over here part of the domain? No, right? When do we start getting an intersection? At 0. 0, and then onward. So the domain, 0 to infinity. And for the blue function, range is the set of all y values. Well, do we get y values down here? No, not down here. When do we start getting y values? At 3. At 3. And then we get, get them from that point on. And what I want you to make sure that you see is that, yes, look, the domain and range swapped. Of course, that makes perfect sense, right? Because remember, our, our conception of a function is as a machine that you, you push an input into it, and then it produces an output. Functions which are invertible are machines that have the property that you could push the output back in, and then an input would pop out back on the other side. Machines that can do that. So if this function, if this is the set of possible inputs, and that's the set of possible outputs, then when you run the machine in reverse, then the set of inputs and outputs are swapped. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's actually compute the inverse function. Okay, so this is just like we did on the previous page. So you start with the, with the function, then you replace the function with its formula.
And now what? Correct. So this <coughs> is now this. So what we've done here is that this, this line right here, this line right here, represents something that looks like this. So the, that line represents something that looks like that. This line, when you, the action of swapping x's and y's, now this represents something that looks like this. Okay. So now, all that's required from here is just algebraic circuits where you now resolve for y. So what do we need to do to solve for y? Square. Square both sides. So remember that when you have radicals and squares mixing, that in one order you get absolute value, in the other order you do not get absolute value. So what is the case for this one? You do not get it. Right? It's the other order. The other order where, it's the, where the radical is on the outside where you get absolute value, but only when it's an even radical. Okay, so then you get x squared equal to y minus 3, and so x squared plus 3 is y, and so that tells us what the inverse function is. So what is the inverse function? Okay, and that is almost right. There's one little bit that we need to add to make our answer correct. Because, let's consider for a moment here. Correct. So, on zero to three, uh, zero to infinity. So, this information, this information is a consequence of this. <coughs> So let's make sure that it's clear why, why we need this. So if we didn't include the red, the red, the red um, clause on 0 to 3, let's consider, what does this look like? It yeah. Like Correct. So why is x squared plus 3 when you, when you consider it all by itself? It looks like this. And this most definitely could not be the inverse function of anything at all, whatsoever. Why not? It, it's not invertible. Right? It, it's this thing that I've drawn doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So there's no way it could be the inverse of something. It would be like me asking, well, is 0 the multiplicative inverse of 8? No. <laughs> Now, you could verify that by, by actually computing the product of 0 and 8 <laughs> and saying, okay, it's not 1. But you could have said no even before that. 0 doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. So it's certainly not the multiplicative inverse of 8. So this function itself, this function definitely is not the inverse function because it's not invertible in the first place. So what is the, the action of, of taking this statement and then adding the red clause does what to this? It chops off the left side. Exactly. question about this example. OK, 
Okay, so let's move to something completely different. <laughs> so now we're in section 6.1. Oh, I don't need to write the date. I only write the date on the first page. I need to write the section. That's what I need to do. Okay, section 6.1 is called something like exponentials. So let's start out <coughs> with an example. And let's consider two functions that look, at least visually, their formulas look pretty similar. So f of x is x squared, and let's compare this to um, g of x is 2 to x. So these formulas are pretty similar looking. They have, both of them have an x and a 2. Both of them have a base and an exponent. But they're just in opposite positions, right? This one is x to 2, and this one is 2 to x. So they look pretty similar. So on that account, you might, you might think that they behave similarly. But you would be mistaken. <laughs> they're quite different. So this one is, is our good old friend, the standard parabola. So we know exactly what it does. As a plot, it looks like this. So I'm going to leave a spot here for a moment. I'm going to draw what this one does. OK. But before we do that, let's make a little table. So how about uh, x? of x, g of x. OK. <coughs> so how about, uh, so normally I, I want to do these in order, like numeric order, but it's not going to happen this time. So uh, how about x is 0? What do you get if you plug 0 into f? Zero. You get 0, because 0 squared is 0. What do you get if you plug 0 into g? One. You get 1. 2 to 0 is 1. OK. How about let's plug in something like, um, say, uh, 1. Okay, so if you plug in 1 to f, what do you get? 1. What do you get if you plug it into g? Two. Okay. okay, how about if we plug in um, two? You get four for F, and what do you get for G? Four. Okay. What if you get, what if you plug in um, four? You get 16 for F. And what do you get for G? No? You get 16. 2 to 4. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So you might think, well, I don't know. They're not all that different. Let's plug in, say, um, 10. Jump ahead a little bit. What's 10 squared? 100. OK. How about what is 2 to 10? It's 1, 0, 2, 4. Mm 
it would it would be in your interest to memorize the powers of ten, uh, powers of two. Up to like ten. Okay, how about maybe how about maybe a bigger number, like say twenty. Well, what's twenty squared? Four hundred. Okay. Well, what's two to twenty? So this, th yeah, this is this is two. This is the product of two ten times, right? So you t this is two. This one is two times 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 two. That's one zero two four. So now to do it to twenty, that means we we need to do another ten of them. So that'd be approximately. Well, it would be exactly one thousand twenty four squared. So it'd be about a thousand squared. So that's a million. So let let's, let's let me get my calculator here. Two to twenty. My calculator is saying that it's 1,048,576. Okay, so they're starting to be different. <laughs> All right? <laughs> okay, there's a diff diff differences are becoming apparent. Okay, how about let's, let's we, we went positive for a little bit. Let's go negative for a little bit. How about, um, what if you plug in negative one? one? You get one when you, when you square negative one. What about two to negative one? one half. half. We half. Okay, how about um, negative two? When you square that, you get four. And what's two to negative two? One fourth. Okay. How about uh, negative four? You get sixteen. So notice these numbers are the same as above, and that's due to this symmetry here. Uh, what is two to negative four? One over sixteen. So now, for those of you that are having a little bit of difficulty with that, let's remember that 2 to negative 4, how could this expression be written with, a, with positive exponents only? 1 over 2 to 4. Right? So moving it to the denominator has the effect of, of making that, that exponent positive. And then 2 to 4, well that's 2 times 2, which is 4, multiplied by 2 times 2, which is another 4. So this is 1 over 16. Okay, then, you know, I could say, well, how about, you know, because why not negative 10? If you plug in negative 10 to f, you get 100. And what do you get if you plug negative 10 into g? 1 over 1024. So this, the further you go to the left, you keep getting 1 over a bigger and bigger number. Right, if we, go to, if we go to negative 20, we'll get 1 over a million-ish. Okay, if we go to negative 32, we'll get 1 over about 4 billion. So, so what this looks like, what this looks like, is right here, at 0, it crosses 1. And then it goes up, and it goes up fast very fast, much faster than this one, right? So by the time you get to 20, on the, x is 20 for this one, the output is 400. But the, by the time you get to x is 20 for this one, the output is a million. So what does it do as you go to the left? Right, it decays to zero. So this is what exponential function looks like. So as far as the formula is concerned, visually, they're, the formulas, to me anyway, look quite similar. x to 2 versus 2 to x. But the behavior, the analytic and the geometric behavior is as different as different can be. And we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. Have a nice Monday.